Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation about secure and efficient software masking on superscalar pipeline processors. My name is Barbara and this work is joint work by my colleagues and me from Graz University of Technology. So first of all, in the setting of physical side channel attacks, we have a specific device. For example, a credit card, a SIM card, a government ID. And this device has a certain asset, like a cryptographic key. On the other hand, we have an attacker who has physically access to this device. This means that the attacker can observe certain properties of the device. For example, the attacker might observe the power consumption of a microprocessor which executes cryptographic software. What can the attacker then do with this information? The power consumption of a CPU, for example, depends on two things. First of all, the instructions which are being executed by the CPU and second of all, the data which is involved in these instructions, which might be, in the case of an AES implementation, the key which is processed by the implementation. In order to prevent power analysis attacks, we have to break the dependency between the Sphinx and the power consumption. This can be done by applying a countermeasure which is called masking. Masking is a secret sharing technique where we split our sensitive value, so the value we want to protect, into multiple random shares. If the attacker can now observe up to d of these d plus 1 shares, it will not reveal any information about the sensitive value. Here I have one example. Um, this could be uh, the attacker observing the power consumption of a masked uh, AES implementation, where we have split our key into three parts, K1, K2, and K3. Then the power consumption at each point in time will only depend on one part of the key, but never on the um, unshared key itself. So masking is very nice, but it has several problems. One of it is that the assumption of a mask software implementation is that uh, independent computations in the software result in independent leakage. Uh, let me give you an example. We have a microprocessor um, which executes a certain row of instructions and the assumption here would be that each instruction leads to independent leakage. So that's only um, cause leakage of the data which is processed by the instructions. And this is unfortunately not the case in, um, yeah, in some microprocessors. How can we fix this? First of all, we can adapt our mask software to the microprocessor itself. And um, we can do that if we know several things about our microarchitecture and we know um, the leakage behavior of the microarchitecture, then we can fine tune our software such that um, leakage will not be caused during execution. Second, we can also apply a lazy engineering approach. This means um, if we do not know that much about our microarchitecture, we can simply say we use a protection order which is higher than theoretically required except a certain leakage and a certain loss of um, protection orders um, and uh, yeah, simply apply a masking scheme with higher order than actually required. Um, these are two approaches, uh, but what they have in common is that the runtime of mask software when applying each approach is significantly increased. And the second point is that it still requires manual leakage assessments, um, which um, is done in order to make sure that there is really no exploitable leakage, so that our um, our fixes have really um, yeah, prevented the problem. Therefore, in our work, um, we want to evaluate 
uh, the security of mask software on complex processes because manual leakage assessment is not so easy there anymore. Um, for example, if you apply lazy engineering or um, fine tune your mask software, you might still get leakage in your manual assessments and you will not um, be able to find out so easy where this leakage comes from and how to fix it. Therefore, we want to focus in our work on the security of mask software in such a complex processor. By complex processor, I mean processors with multiple pipeline stages, with forwarding logic between the stages, um, which are maybe super scalar and have even data caches. And yeah, as already said, the analysis for these processors can barely be done manually anymore. Therefore, we want to stick to a formal approach. Uh, in our case study, we focus on the risk 5 swerve core, which is exactly um, one core you would consider more complex. And we focus on the following questions. First of all, which uh, CPU components are the components which will cause problems in the context of masking? And how can we deal with these problems? Second of all, um, are there things we need to change in our software? And uh, which things do we need to change? And are there general rules which we can apply to our software to get um, secure software in the end on such complex cores? And last, uh, how can we still design uh, efficient mask software? So these rules, of course, add a certain overhead to the mask software, but is there a way um, to keep this overhead low? As already said, we consider the Swerve Core as the target processor platform for our analysis. The Swerve Core is an open source RISC-V core, which was designed by Western Digital. Um, the core is applied in, I would say, data intensive uh, fields of applications, for example, for storage controllers. It is comparable to an ARM Cortex-A15. The core is an in-order core and features a dual issue pipeline. This means that it can uh, not only execute one instruction per clock cycle, but two instructions per clock cycle. And it has some load store buffers. Some of them can be compared to a small data cache. The Swerve Core has nine pipeline stages. Here in the figure, you can see them. So the first three pipeline stages are responsible for fetching instructions from memory. Then these instructions are decoded and sent to uh, one of the two ALUs, for example. And of course, um, there is a certain part which handles forwarding between these pipeline stages, such that we can, uh, for example, forward a result from the sixth pipeline stage back to the input of the ALU. The last two stages are responsible for commit and write back. Our goal in our um, analysis is that we investigate the security of mask software when executed on the Swerve core by using formal methods. And um, when it comes to such an analysis, one has to think about uh, the attacker's abilities. And we do that by using a certain probing model. The classical probing model, which you apply for hardware because a CPU is hardware, um, yeah, equips the attacker with D probes. So the attacker has D probes and can distribute these probes um, as the attacker likes in the hardware circuit. And each probe will deliver the value of a specific gate or wire back to the attacker. This is good because um, by using the classical probing model for hardware, we can um, capture side effects like glitches, transitions, but it is actually not that suitable for mask software because the attacker is too powerful. For example, if the attacker places one of its probes uh, to the output of the register file of the CPU, um, the probe will still or will always deliver um, every value which is ever contained in any register and which is read in any instruction. So this is immediately broken and we cannot really design a mask software with that probing model. Um, 
Instead, we decided to stick to the time constraint probing model, um, where the attacker can use the D probe, so this is the same as in the classical probing model, to measure a specific gate or wire, but only for the duration of one clock cycle. And the attacker, which is also important, can distribute these probes um, as the attacker likes into multiple clock cycles or um, multiple wires and gates. Um, the time constraint probing model is actually applied in a previous work um, in the work about the COCO verification tool, um, which we will also apply for our analysis. So the COCO verification tool verifies that a certain piece of mask software, when executed with a specific CPU netlist, is secure in the time constraint probing model. So you can see it here in the figure. The COCO tool takes as an input the mask software, the CPU netlist, and also um, a certain piece of background information, for example, the location of the shares um, when the execution starts, so in which register is which share, in which memory location is which share, and so on. And you give that information to the verifier, and the verifier will check for each gate in the CPU nets list for each cycle in the execution whether um, an attacker can um, measure some information about any um, yeah any native unshared value there. And if the verification is successful, the verifier will output yes secure. Otherwise, it will say no, it's not secure, and it will give us. Um, the cycle and the gate which causes the leak in the implementation. Um, the work about COCO also included a, a case study of the RISC-V EBEX core. So the EBEX core is a simple and small core, but it already contains uh, hardware components which is problematic. Um, for example, the register file. So uh, the register file um, can um, actually be a threat to the security of masked software because there are parts which can cause glitches and transitions and which will lead into leaks. Um, the work also suggested some modifications to do um, to the hardware, so to the EBEX core in order to obtain a secured EBEX core. The secured EBEX core will then allow the execution of mask software without any leaks as long as um, certain software constraints are followed. So the initial work about the RISC-V EBEX core su suggested first of all fixes which can be applied to hardware, to your microprocessor, and constraints which has to be met by your software such that you can execute and guarantee that the execution of the software is secure. Um, now we do not want to consider the EVEX core, but the more complex Swerve core. And our initial analysis with COCO shows that the Swerve has similar problems. So one problematic component there is also the register file. And um, we find out that we can simply map the hardware fixes which were suggested in this work to the Swerve core, to obtain the secured Swerve core, so to say. And the secured Swerve core will be the base point for analysis for all our further experiments. Um, yeah. So now let's start with the actual formal analysis. So we have our secured Swerve core and now we want to verify something. Um, we chose uh, to verify software which is generated by Tornado as a starting point. So Tornado is a nice tool which will uh, generate mask C implementations based on unmasked high level descriptions of ciphers. And uh, not only that, but it will also give you a security proof in the register probing model. The register probing model is a probing model which is um, often chosen for uh, software, so for mask software in which an attacker can place the probe on a specific register for one cycle. 
In our experiment, we generate uh, several masked uh, Ketchak SBOX implementations with Tornado. With several, I mean we generate four different implementations. Each uh, implementation refers to one masking order. And then we use Coco to verify the execution of this software on the secured Swerve core. The result of this uh, verification is that the implementations lose all protection orders because there are certain components in the Swerve core which cause, first of all, big problems. So by this we mean that there are components combining more than two shares and small problems. So there are components which combine up to two shares. Let me give you one example of such a big problem. So um, here we try to visualize um, the execution of software which contains 10 shares and the shares are in the pipeline at the same time due to the masking scheme. So the masking itself is correct on algorithmic level. Then we perform a gate leveling timer simulation of the Swerve core to visualize um, whether glitches and transitions on a specific wire in the processor's forwarding log logic can lead to any leaks. Um, of course, for this experiment, we use a specific cell library. So the cell library will map um, timings and um, yeah, area constraints to each gate which is used in the Swerve gate list. And this is the result of the, of the analysis. So the question was again, um, an, an attacker who probes a wire in the pipers logic of the Swerve core for the duration of one clock cycle, so this is important, um, what can the attacker see? And we've visualized what the attacker could see here in this timing diagram. So first of all, for example, there is the first share, then we have a combination of two shares. Then we see even combinations of up to three shares uh, and the wire switching around before finally stabilizing to the value um, the wire should have. So in the end, we found out that the attacker can observe up to five shares when this specific cell library and this concrete timings are used. So this would be a big problem. Um, yeah, so we saw this uh, in the processor's um, forwarding logic and then we use Coco to analyze what the exact problem is there. So here you see a diagram of the forwarding logic of the Swerve core. You see um, here each pipeline stage. Uh, so here is the decode stage, the ALU stage and the further execution stages. And here we have a multiplexer which will forward the data from the correct uh, pipeline stage to the ALU. Um, yeah, the multiplexer has a select signal which is called M1 select and the select signal um, is computed by combinatorial logic, which means that it might glitch. And if a glitch happens, um, also the output of the multiplexer will glitch. And if you imagine now a software where we have multiple shares of the same secret in each pipeline stage. Then uh, forward data will um, kind of uh, forward the result of each share um, to the ALU when M1 select glitches. And then we combine multiple shares and this is what we call a big problem. Now the question is how can we fix that? Um, first of all, we thought about fixing that in hardware, similar to what was suggested in the work about the EBEX core. But um, yeah, that would involve that we need to gate each uh, pipeline register with a bit indicating whether uh, the value of the register should be forwarded to the ALU or not. Um, this could be done, but the gate bits need to be glitch free and this is not that easy to achieve and requires in the end a very large latency overhead, which is impractical. Instead, um, we need to find some solution in software. Um, basically, 
the software solution or the software constraint as we call it needs to ensure that at no time uh, there are multiple shares of the same native value in the pipeline. How can we do that? We need to make sure that uh, the distance between two instructions which um, process shares of the same native value is uh, large enough so that there are enough unrelated instructions between them. What do I mean by unrelated instructions? Well, in the basic case, this is an op operation. But um, it can also be an instruction which processes a share from another secret or a ALU operation on non-secret data, like incrementing the counter of a loop. Um, we uh, performed further analysis and um, it turns out that there are a lot of other components um, which cause leaks in the Swerve core. If you're interested, you can have a look at the paper. I will now um, only give you one more example, which are the management components of the data memory. For example, there is a component which is called the LSU bus buffer. This is similar to a small data cache. And um, there might happen a leak if the buffer contains a store and uh, this, uh, uh, if the buffer contains a share, sorry, and uh, the share is overwritten by its counterpart by performing another loader store um, instruction. So this is uh, really bad. And again, the hardware solutions turned out to be impractical and we need more software constraints. For example, uh, for the LSU bus buffer, the software constraints would, would be to flush the buffer um, between loading two shares of the same native value. Okay, so this was uh, the results we had for the Swerve core, and now we try to uh, derive some generic rules for that. Um, so our analysis clearly shows that software constraints are necessary, um, even though we already work with a secured or hardened version of the Swerve core. Uh, one effective software constraint turned out to be the insertion of unrelated instruction between two instructions. And um, the question is now how many instructions need to be inserted there? And um, this number can actually be expressed in terms of um, the length of the pipeline of the core and the amount of execution units. So here I divide um, the amount of pipeline stages P into PI and PT. PI is the number of stages um, which deal with fetching the instructions, so no, no data is involved there. And PT uh, is the number of instructions which actually processes data. And uh, it turns out that you need PT times E, the amount of execution units, um, uh, plus one unrelated instructions between uh, yeah, two dangerous instructions. And um, we also tried to formulate a factor for the order reduction. So if we want to um, apply the lazy engineering approach, how many or how much uh, more orders do I need um, in my masking scheme to still be secure on such a processor? And the factor we computed here is actually the reduction factor of um, a lazily engineered mask software implementation when executed on such a complex uh, pipeline processor. Okay, so now I have told you that we need a lot of software constraints even on a secured Swerve core. Um, and if one adapts these rules or constraints strictly, you can imagine the overhead is really huge. Here I have a table which summarizes this. So uh, you see um, a certain set of example programs we have here, for example, a DOM and gate. Then we compare um, the number of cycles and the number of instructions required by this software. When we implement it without constraints and uh, when we implement it um, with constraints. So by applying the rules strictly, so to say.
Um, if we have constraints, I also give you the number of total instructions and the number of knobs. So uh, knobs are kind of the unrelated instructions um, which had to be mapped to, to knobs. And as we see here, for example, for the DOM end, we need uh, 33 uh, cycles instead of only 10 when we have no constraints. Or if we look at higher order implementations, it's even worse. So here we need 33 cycles without constraints, but 250 cycles with constraints. And considering the number of instructions, uh, we almost need 300 instruction, instructions and the major amount of those is knobs. So uh, unrelated instructions where we cannot really do anything um, which makes sense or anything useful. Can we change that? Yes. The answer is yes. So if we, um, we apply the right implementation techniques, we can reduce this overhead, fortunately. Um, one of these implementation techni te techniques is to stick to parallel implementations instead of serial implementations. Let me explain that based on an example. Um, assume we have a Ketchuk S-Box and the state of this S-Box consists of five lanes. Each lane itself is again shared into D shares. In a serial implementation, we would take the D shares of three lanes, process them and store the output lane. Then we would again take the D shares of the three lanes, process them and store them in the output lane. Of course, there are lots of unrelated instructions which would be needed to separate the processing of the D shares for the same native value. Uh, in the case of parallel instructions, on the uh, parallel um, implementations, on the other hand, um, we use instead of the knobs, which we would use in serial implementations, computations of shares of other lanes. So we kind of mix um, the computation of the lanes. Um, here you can see one example. So here we have a serial implementation of a DOM Ketchuk S-Box compared to the parallel implementation. And if we uh, now compare the overhead, which the constra constraints introduce for a serial implementation, um, we have uh, 80 in cycles compared to 240. But if we do that in a parallel way, um, the overhead is much smaller. So we have 36 cycles compared to 81 cycles. And also um, here we have uh, almost 100 instructions compared to 400, with a lot of the 400 being knobs. And here we can really um, use, uh, seven, um, use 79 out of the 144 instructions are only knobs. Uh, okay, so let's have a look at another technique, which is called threshold implementation. So threshold implementation is, is a masking technique, which is based on the property of non-complete component functions. So non-complete means that I can compute each component function in such a masking scheme. Um, and I need for the computation, um, all the shares except of one. So the computation is independent of at least one of its input shares. For the TI catcher S box, this would mean that um, the linear layer can still be done in sequence for each share. But when it comes to the nonlinear layer, where we will require multiple shares, we will do it in sequence for each component function. Um, this means, on the other hand, that we can ignore smaller problems. So small problems are the problems where we combine up to two shares because we have component functions which will only um, ever compute um, based on, in the first order case, two shares. Um, and we can therefore ignore the small problems. But, um, of course, um, the downside is that uh, we need three shares for first order security. However, the results were really promising. Here we have a TI Ketchuk S-Box um, and we see that um, 
yeah, 66 cycles are required without constraints, but with constraints, only 72 cycles are uh, required. And from the unrelated instructions, only 15 are knobs. Uh, for the ESCON implementation, which we also did, um, we have 70, uh, 721 cycles compared to um, almost 1,700 cycles here. Um, the overhead is mainly due to register splitting and also um, due to uh, memory overhead because the ASCON state is much bigger than the Ketchuk state and therefore we cannot hold all our shares in the register file all the time. So we have to load and store the shares and this introduces on the Swerve core um, a lot of uh, overhead because we have to clear the load store buffer. So, um, yeah, but this actually already leads me to the end of my presentation. So um, we've discussed that architectural side effects of complex CPUs can reduce the security of mask software by multiple orders. And this is due to problematic components, which cause big or small um, problems. So uh, the combination of um, of more than two or up to two shares. And these components are mostly pipelines and memory management components. And um, however, we showed that it is still possible to have secure and efficient masking when we um, carefully consider both hardware and software. So thank you all for listening. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention.